Um, so we got off to a, a late start this morning. Um, uh, I wanted to note a couple things uh, before starting in this presentation today on um, imaging with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, one is, uh, you probably noticed uh, there is a time change for this particular talk. Um, uh, early in the year, the talks have been at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Time or noon Pacific. Um, and we're going to be moving to a model um, where we have the uh, times earlier in the day um, to try and support um, European members of the community. Um, so unfortunately, um, this semester through December is going to be a little bit confusing. Most of the talk times are going to be at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, um, but some of them will be at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, and then we're going to move to a model where um, uh, next semester, uh, starting in January, all the talks will be at uh, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern to support the European community. Um, so I hope this is the first in a series of practical talks about various instrument modes. Oh, okay. Um, various instrument modes. Um, and so uh, we're going to begin with uh, imaging, um, which is hopefully the most straightforward mode. Um, if you looked at the schedule for this semester, you'll see that there will be talks about uh, coronography, the IFUs, the MSA, um, the NERSPEC MSA, and then also um, some talks about uh, calibration as well. Um, so before I get started, I just wanted to introduce myself uh, relatively quickly. Um, so my name is Christine Chen. I'm one of two uh, deputy uh, project scientists uh, here at Space Telescope for, for JWST. Um, uh, before I took this position just about a month ago, um, I was a MIRI instrument scientist, so I'm relatively more knowledgeable about MIRI than the other instruments. Um, uh, I've also uh, helped to lead the JWST calibration and, and commissioning working group. Um, I did that for about three years, so I'm, I'm generally familiar with the other instruments as well, um, but I have more expertise with MIRI. Um, I wanted to say that uh, there was last week a really excellent conference um, geared toward preparing the community for observing with JWST. Um, this was sponsored by the European Space Astronomy Center, the, uh, ESAC, in Madrid. Um, and uh, I've shown here the website um, for the conference where they plan to post all the presentations. Um, so this was a, about a three day long meeting. It concluded um, uh, general talks about the instruments and then more specific talks about the instrument modes as well to help people get familiar with the capabilities of the instruments. Um, and so you'll see that there was a session on imaging um, uh, with talks uh, from representing each of the instrument teams. And so I've cribbed heavily um, from the slides um, that were presented there, um, but then I also have some additional information which I, I hope will um, motivate better uh, some of the decisions that have been made for operations for, for the instruments. Um, so I think um, starting at the 40,000 foot level, um, when we think about um, imaging with JWST, uh, we know that there are three instruments that will be available. Um, NERCAM, which is the primary workhorse imager uh, that operates at near-infrared wavelengths uh, between about 0.6 microns and about 5 microns. And complementary to that is um, MIRI, uh, which has an imager as well, that operates from about 5 to uh, just short of about 30 microns. Um, the long wavelength uh, capability of MIRI is uh, determined by the detector cutoff. Um, and then in addition, there is the near-infrared imager and slitless spectrograph. Um, nearest, which will also provide um, some capability and will also provide capability in the near infrared. Um, so specifically what I'm going to talk about today is direct imaging. Um, so I'm not going to talk about, for example, coronography, which is also shown on this slide. This slide shows you an approximate size. It gives you an idea of what the fields of view um, of the instruments are. But perhaps a, a more useful way to think about the instrument package is to imagine the focal plane. And so you can see here in the center um, the NERCAM field of view. Um, NERCAM is uh, actually, uh, well, Massimo Roberto, who's a longtime NERCAM instrument scientist, recommends thinking of NERCAM as an instrument that essentially gives you access to um, a rectangular field of view, um, which is uh, in the shorter direction, about 2.2 um, arc minutes by about five arc minutes. And then there's this gap between uh, those two particular fields of view. Um, and uh, you, get si you can have simultaneous observations both in the short wavelength and long wavelength channels um, together. And so in doing so, coverage uh, both uh, 
somewhere between uh, 0.6 and 2.5 microns and 2.5 to uh, 5 microns. Um, you can see offset um, is uh, MIRI and NIRIS. Um, I should remark that uh, NIRCAM is going to be the primary instrument for white wavefront sensing and control. Um, and uh, as a result, like MIRI and NIRIS, MIRI is relatively less uh, sensitive to changes in the PSF because of the long wavelength bands um, or more off axis. Um, and so you can see uh, the approximate separation um, between uh, the two uh, fields of view shown to scale here. Um, and then for NIRIS as well. So the nearest field of view is about consistent with one of the uh, 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 SCA or one of these blocks within a module um, for NERCAM. So just for comparison, uh, here are all the imaging fields of view shown together. So again, NERCAM with the 2.2 by about five arc minutes. Um, uh, NERCAM is actually, uh, because it's used for wavefront sensing and control, is designed to be redundant. So it's actually uh, two cameras that are bolted back together. And um, this is what gives rise to this uh, intramodule gap or which is uh, 44 arc seconds big. Um, and then uh, you can see here outlined in blue, these are the individual SCAs, the detectors um, for the short wavelength camera, and the red dashed lines are for the uh, long wavelength camera. You can see that there are four uh, short wavelength SCAs that are put together to fill um, the same field of view as a long wavelength camera. Um, and so there is a SCA gap here on the order of a few um, arc seconds. And then for comparison, again, NERIS's field of view is approximately similar to one of the module fields of view for NERCAM. And then uh, MIRI is somewhat smaller, and you can see that it's also rectangular. Um, so this is just a quick outline of my presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to give you a sense for um, what the instrument, uh, how it's, uh, what filters are available, um, where it's Nyquist sampled and things like that to think so to frame how you think about using um, NERCAM. Um, then I'll also tell you about a lot of the operations work that's been done here at the Institute um, uh, over many years, um, including defining the dithering patterns, the readout patterns, um, the sensitivities and saturation limits. A lot of this uh, has been uh, initially we had requirements numbers and some of these have been updated to reflect uh, values from testing. Um, the subarrays that have been designed, and then uh, I'll speak a little bit about uh, the parallel observation capabilities that will be available in cycle one. Um, so beginning with the first instrument, NERCAM, um, the uh, chart on the left side of the chart, this grayed out um, uh, figure, shows you the detector layout um, within the instrument. Um, and so you can see on the right side here, this is module A, and here's module B. Um, and these four detectors are the detectors that make up the short wavelength channel. Um, and here's the detector for the long wavelength channel. Um, and they have individual names, which um, are, are slightly relevant later. Um, for all of these charts, I will um, I list a URL for the pocket guide for the instrument. So this is an excellent resource to go to to learn more information. Um, in addition, uh, I've shown here for each of the instruments um, what the uh, filter response curves look like. In this particular case, this is, includes the OTE throughput as well. And so you can see the extra wide, wide, medium, and narrow filters here. So I, I think um, a couple of uh, really important things to say about NERCAM. Um, one is the short wavelength plate scale is 32 milliarc seconds per pixel. This is about half the plate scale of the long wavelength channel, which is 65 milliarc seconds per pixel. Um, and uh, if you uh, look at uh, the pixel size, um, you'll see that uh, the instrument is Nyquist sampled at two microns in the short wavelength channel. Remember that short wavelength channel goes between 0.6 and 2.5 microns. So this means that for the majority of the wavelength coverage um, in the short wavelength channel, NERCAM is undersampled. And uh, the similar thing is true for the long wavelength channel. Um, its wavelength coverage, again, is 2.5 to 5 microns. And you can see that it's Nyquist sampled at 4. So again, um, uh, NERCAM is going to be um, undersampled for the majority of its wavelength range. Um, and then here is a, a diagram uh, showing the pupil and filter wheels um, for NERIS. And I just wanted to explain uh, quickly how um, uh, direct imaging with NERIS will work. Um, essentially, uh, the instrument has been designed such that the short wavelength filters are in the pupil wheel and the long wavelength filters are in the filter wheel. So 
uh, if you would like to uh, take an image um, in a short wavelength filter, um, you uh, select the clear filter as the active element and pair it uh, with the filter that you would like to request. Um, and uh, the opposite is true then when you try to do uh, imaging in the long wavelength filters. Um, you select uh, the uh, clear pupil in the pupil wheel as the active um, element and then select the corresponding long wavelength filter that you'd like to use. And so um, you can see off to the side, uh, here's a chart showing the throughputs for uh, the various uh, filters. Um, I should say that uh, these filters are matched to the NERCAM filters. They're comparable in sensitivity. Um, and so really, when you pair NERIS with NERCAM, you increase the aerial coverage of the sky. Um, but of course, you know, the field of view is only half that of NERCAM. And just like uh, NERCAM, the pixels are relatively large. Um, here, the plate scale is 65 milliarc seconds at any of the wavelengths that you're working at and your Nyquist sampled at four microns. So now you're going from 0.6 to five microns and your Nyquist sampled at four. And so this means that um, in some sense, NERIS is even more undersampled um, than NERCAM. Um, so this next chart is for MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. Um, MIRI is, is actually um, two instruments uh, sort of put together. Um, one is the medium resolution spectrograph and um, the other is uh, the MIRI imager. Um, so uh, if you look at this uh, field of view in the focal plane, um, the big square shows you um, where the imager is and offset to the side, this is the field of view for the medium resolution spectrometer. Um, so David Law later uh, this semester will tell you about IFUs including the MIRI IFU. Um, uh, the MIRI imager provides a lot of different capabilities. Um, you can see this large rectangular field is um, designed uh, for imaging, but you can see that uh, along the right edge in this picture of the detector that um, various areas have been blocked off uh, in some sense to use in, in concert with the chronographs. Um, in particular, these three areas are for use with the four quadrant phase masks. Um, at 10.5, 11.4, and 15.5 microns. Um, four quadrant phase masks um, operate over a very narrow wavelength range, and so um, each one of these is essentially uh, tailored to a specific filter. Um, and this is in contrast at the bottom. You can see the field of view for the Leo coronagraph, um, where you actually have a physical occulting spot. Um, it's uh, designed to work at 23 microns, so this occulting spot is, several, is, is quite large. It's uh, several arc seconds. Um, the mirror imager includes not only the coronagraphs, but also the low resolution spectrograph. If you look closely here, you'll see a slit and um, light, a star, a star or a target can be placed on this aperture and then the light will be dis dispersed upward. But really today I'm just gonna talk about the imager. Um, you can see again, there are, are resources here that you can go check out, the pocket guide. And there's actually for MIRI, um, the encyclopedia of MIRI, which is a uh, PASP volume of 10 articles um, about MIRI focusing, for example, on each of the instrument modes, the calibration, operations, things like that. Um, and then again, you can see um, the, the throughput for the instrument. Um, uh, I'd like to highlight here, um, given the plate scale for MIRI, 110 milliarc seconds per pixel, um, MIRI's Nyquist sampled at seven microns. So that means that unlike NERCAM and NERIS, um, MIRI will actually be oversampled for the vast majority of its wavelength range. So our reconstruction of, of, um, of uh, barely resolved sources will be less challenging. Um, so onward to uh, dither patterns. Um, um, Jay Anderson uh, spent a, a good deal of time uh, sketching out the uh, dither patterns um, associated with uh, the NERCAM instrument. Um, NERCAM has, uh, you can imagine that there's a couple of things that you would try to do with um, imaging with NERCAM. Um, one is uh, you might try to uh, tile a fairly large uh, region of the sky. Um, to do that, you would actually use mosaicing. Um, but for uh, smaller uh, mosaics, you might instead um, choose to use uh, these full patterns, which are large fields without, this produces large fields without gaps. Um, and so uh, there's actually a total of nine of these patterns that you can choose from that give you this sort of approximately rectangular field of view, which you can build on. Um, and you can see that um, uh, by looking at the individual figures um, that 
uh, they use as their basis a different number of um, uh, dithers. Um, so full three, for example, includes three dithers. There's six, nine, 15, 21, and uh, 27, 36, and 45. Um, and you can imagine that if you use, for example, the full three pattern, um, that this leaves you with regions of the sky that don't have a lot of coverage, meaning that uh, they're only visited once um, in your dither pattern. So um, these numbers here indicate the percentage of the field, um, which is covered by uh, one image, two image, or three images. So in this particular pattern, the majority of the field is covered by two. Um, and if, uh, if you want to do more detailed coverage, you can imagine selecting all the way up to the full 45 pattern. Um, and you can see here that uh, regions in this field of view have somewhere between 34 and 28 um, different uh, images. Of course, uh, this redundancy is very helpful, for example, for cosmic ray rejection and other things. Um, so this is really for um, trying to map larger areas of the sky when they're not so large that you really want to use a mosaic. Sure. Um, I mean, th I think that depends on your signal to noise requirements, right? So, um, uh, so I'll say a little bit more about observing overheads now, uh, a little bit later. Um, but uh, most of the exact numbers are not ready to be released yet. Um, so I can only make sort of generic statements, which will just sound logical to you. So, um, but th they will f they will finalize the numbers in the fall of 2017. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, that's not very satisfying. Um, okay, so there are these full patterns uh, for covering lar relatively large areas uh, in comparison to the instrument field of view. You can imagine that two other issues that you might have are um, trying to cover the gaps between um, the modules, so that that's what this would do fairly effectively, and then also within the SCA as well. So um, pattern number two for NERCAM is an intermodule um, a pattern which uh, tries to improve the, the, the coverage within the module. Um, and you can see you can select, for example, three or 16 positions. Um, and then for very small objects uh, compared to uh, the SCA, um, you can select these um, intra-SCA patterns. So that's for objects that are smaller than the detector, so less than 50 arc seconds or 100 arc seconds, depending on um, whether you're using the short or wave, long wavelength channels. Um, and so you can see uh, the dip for the dither size, um, what your science target size might be. So this is a little bit confusing um, because the small dithers mean that you have a large science target um, uh, that you're trying to uh, uh, observe better. Um, in particular, these dither patterns are sort of optimized for um, improving the measurements of the flat field. So um, in addition to the primary dithers, um, which essentially move the astronomical object um, on the field of view by a lot, um, there's also going to be um, secondary dithers allowed. Um, these are very fine dithers that are um, fractions of a pixel plus maybe some integer um, to improve the subpixel sampling to improve your image reconstruction. Um, and uh, uh, Jay is uh, very interested in astrometry, so he has enabled a whole suite of secondary dithers. Um, for, so the key parameter here is to choose the number of secondary dithers that you'd like. It can be anywhere between one and about 64. So um, this chart here shows you the positions, the pointings um, for uh, NS, the number of secondary dithers, between one and nine. Um, all of these particular patterns are fairly compact, um, so they fit within a 10 pixel by 10 pixel box. Um, of course, they uh, grow somewhat larger when you uh, select uh, larger numbers of secondary dithers. Okay, so moving on to nearest. Um, uh, I should emphasize uh, 
um, that uh, the position of the NEARS team is that NeuroCam is the better choice for all general imaging applications um, because it is a bigger field of view, simultaneous blue and red channels, and better PSF sampling. Um, so NEARS has an imaging template, um, but it's only to, intended to support peer or coordinated parallels. So as a result, um, the template does not support the use of subarrays, um, and uh, it doesn't drive the dither pattern. So um, you can collect observations with NEARIS um, using the dither pattern of the prime instrument. Um, and then moving on to MIRI. Um, MIRI uh, has uh, three dither patterns in the parlance of uh, the NERCAM instrument. These would all be considered primary dither patterns um, uh, because uh, MIRI provides such good uh, sampling of the PSF, because remember, it's uh, critically sampled at seven, so it's mostly oversampled. Um, so the MIRI dither patterns have a lot of heritage from the spitzer irak instrument. Um, uh, the first pattern that I'm gonna talk about is the Rouleau triangle. This is based on a pattern um, that was used for the IRAC instrument, and it's designed for unresolved or barely resolved sources. Um, just like for the IRAC instrument, this pattern is provided in three sizes, small, medium, and large. Um, and there's a table that shows the recommended, recommended pattern size depending on the size of the subarray um, that you're using. Um, I should say that uh, uh, this, I, if I didn't say it, it has built in the uh, N plus one half um, subsampling. Um, in addition, uh, Miri has um, some two and four point dither patterns. Um, the two point dither patterns are designed for um, taking uh, observations that are offset from your science target so that you can observe the sky, the background. Um, and so um, it's sort of analogous to nodding the telescope. So where you have the science instrument or the science uh, image in one frame and then uh, you offset to a background field in another um, in difference. Um, in addition, uh, there'll be these four point patterns that will be enabled. And again, these are optimized for um, 5.6 and 7.7 .7 microns um, because those are the wavelengths um, at which uh, MIRI is critically or undersampled. So um, the first one is this small point source pattern. Um, you can see it comes in blocks of four um, and it provides the subpixel sampling as well. Um, because MIRI has this elongated rectangular field of view, you can stack these four point uh, patterns um, uh, up um, so that you can uh, dither your target along the long uh, direction of the MIRI field of view. Um, so in addition to there being a point source pattern, um, there's also an extended source pattern as well, uh, again, optimized for the shortest wavelengths. Um, these patterns are actually fairly large. Um, so if you were operating the smallest MIRI subarray, this sub-64, um, you wouldn't get um, optimal observations of your target. And so there's actually an additional, a third subarray pattern, um, which is just optimized for sub-64, where the offsets are more compact. Um, and then the third and last uh, dither pattern for MIRI um, also has um, heritage from IRAC. It's designed to be flexible. So this is based on the IRAC cycling pattern. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar, the cycling pattern um, is actually a table of positions that are drawn randomly from a Gaussian distribution. And so um, the panel on the left-hand side shows you for the field of view um, little crosses for um, positions of the pointing. Um, and so you can see uh, here is the dither distribution and the separation distribution. And so you can see the pattern at the bottom is, more, is the most compact, the small one, the medium is intermediate, and the, the large is the largest. And you can also see this when you look at the size distribution of the, the dithers. Um, here for the small pattern, uh, the dither distribution peaks at around eight or nine pixels. For medium, about 30 or so. And for large, maybe 50 or 60. Um, so the way the uh, cycling pattern worked for IRAC was that um, observers could choose to start in any position in the table. Um, the table had 311 positions. And then you could also specify the number of positions that you wanted to use in the table. You could even specify more than 311 positions. And in this case, um, it would just wrap. Um, so uh, an additional feature for MIRI 
will be um, limited access to what's known as the sparse cycling option. Um, in this particular case, you can just specify um, lines within um, or positions within the table, um, but this is um, a non-standard mode and so has to be well scientifically justified in the proposal. Um, so, uh, so I'd like to move on to um, readout patterns. Um, uh, one of the uh, challenges, I think, of working with JWST is uh, that the data rate from JWST could potentially be very high um, if you were to run all of the um, instruments in modes in which you would get optimal data. And by optimal data, I mean that um, these are non-destructive read detectors. And so if you wanted to capture every frame that you took back to back over um, some period of time, um, capturing every frame is useful because um, for example, if you have a cosmic ray hit, um, you'll see a jump um, in the pixel level from one frame to the next. Um, uh, so unfortunately, it won't be possible to return all of the reads from all of the instruments. Um, and this is because of limitations associated with the JWST downlink. So a JWST can downlink 229 gigabits of data in a nominal four-hour contact with the DSN. Um, the current plans allow for two, hour, two four hour contacts per day. Um, and so um, what I've calculated for you here on the right hand side is the amount of data that you would acquire in 12 hours in the time between contacts. If you ran each of these instruments um, all of the time at their um, uh, fastest frame times. And so for example, with NERCAM, this could really be a problem because you have eight detectors each of them are 2048 by 2048, um, and the frame time is 10, about 10 or 11 seconds. And so you can calculate the data rate in 12 hours, and you would find that it would be um, about an order of magnitude larger than the JWST downlink. And so um, there have been, and, and this is actually not a problem, not only for NERCAM, but actually all of the instruments if you were to use their rapid or fast mode readout patterns. And so um, more complex readout patterns have been developed um, to help with the data rate to ensure that people can, for example, take deep observations of faint targets like brown dwarfs and distant galaxies. Um, and so uh, I think this chart is a nice way to describe um, how exposures will be specified with their NERCAM instrument. Um, so the individual unit um, in the readout pattern is the frame. So the frame is uh, when you clock through all of the pixels within the detector. So for NERCAM, this corresponds to taking about 10.7 seconds. Um, so uh, the next largest unit is a group. And so uh, essentially what happens is you can imagine averaging some of the frames together um, just simply to lower the data rate, but yet uh, retain um, the better readout characteristics of, our, of uh, having taken four frames. Um, and then another strategy is actually to skip frames, so to not return the data from that frame. Um, so a group is um, this unit of how many um, frames you've averaged and skipped. So in this particular case, it's four and one. Um, and then you can build um, an integration from groups. So in this particular case, there are three groups forming this particular integration. Um, uh, users will be able to specify, um, for example, how many groups they want. Um, and you can imagine the kinds of considerations that you might make for um, deciding uh, when your uh, integration was over, for example, when you saturated on your science target. Um, you can, of course, take multiple integrations to form your whole exposure. So um, this uh, figure shows you the whole suite of NERCAM readout patterns that are available. And there are a couple of rules um, that these patterns obey. Um, one is that um, you can have groups of one, two, five, 10, or 20 frames. Um, and the names tell you whether or not the groups are of one, two, five, 10, or 20 frames. So rapid includes groups of one, bright two, shallow five, medium 10, deep 20. Um, and then the onboard electronics are capable of averaging two, four, eight frames within a group. And so for Bright, for example, you can imagine doing 
um, uh, a reset, and then a read, and then a skip, and a read, and a skip. And so that's the bright pattern. Or the other option is to um, uh, take two reads and then average. Um, so you can see in this uh, plot the, the red ones are the skips. Um, you can see, for me, when I, the first time I saw this, um, uh, it was hard to sort of grasp um, you know, in, what, in which phase space you wanted to use which pattern. Um, and so uh, there's actually been a lot of work that's been done at the Institute to try to map out the degeneracies and things like that. Um, I, I will say that, uh, for example, if you look at deep eight versus medium eight, um, you can see that in each case you are retaining um, eight frames, um, but then here you're skipping 12 compared to two. And one of the benefits that's not, I think, immediately apparent from looking at this particular pattern is that the probability of having a cosmic ray um, in this group um, is, in the group that you retain, the eight here, is lower because you skip more frames. So, for example, one of the advantages of deep eight may be that it might be more immune to cosmic ray hits. Um, so here's a table um, basically encapsulating the data that you see visually here. Um, uh, I should mention that uh, uh, groups of 20 has just sort of fallen off here, and deep 2 and deep 8 actually go to n equal 20. Um, so I mentioned quickly that there has been some work that's been done, particularly by Massimo Roberto here at the Institute on the um, NERCAM team, trying to understand uh, when you use which dither pattern. Um, so uh, he did a nice study um, of uh, simulating objects and then uh, calculating the frequency at which um, one of these uh, uh, readout patterns provides the optimal signal to noise and uh, shown how this works as a, f a function of time. And so you can see at short times, um, rapid, where you return all of the frames, is clearly preferred. Um, and at longer times, uh, deep eight is preferred. Um, and then you can see uh, there are various trade-offs in the middle. Um, so sometimes, for example, medium eight might be more useful than deep eight. Um, uh, there are a couple of, of general rules that I think uh, his work revealed. One is um, uh, patterns with a smaller number of n frames um, tend to provide better cosmic ray rejection. So this, again, means that um, you're averaging fewer frames together in a group. Anytime you average frames together in a group, um, you lose the information of where the cosmic ray occurred in the group. And so it makes it more challenging to remove the cosmic ray. Um, uh, by contrast, the pattern with the smallest number of n skips um, means that uh, you have um, improved your uh, read noise as much as possible. Um, and so the sensitivity of um, these observations tends to be better. And so uh, there's a reference there for the um, report that Massimo wrote. Um, uh, in addition, Massimo actually wrote a second report uh, which uh, tried to look in detail about how do you pick um, the readout pattern that provides the optimal signal to noise uh, given uh, the brightness of the illuminating source, this is for point sources. Um, so he has, he's got here electrons per second across the top, and then integration time going down in the columns. And you can see he's uh, labeled out here for um, signal to noise considerations, which um, uh, a readout pattern you would prefer. No. It's not available yet. Um, unfortunately, there is a long list of features that we would like to be incorporated in, into APT, and not all of them will be available in cycle one. Um, so the hope is that some sort of table will be published like this. This might be a little bit old because this was written in 2010, um, but that will make that kind of information available so it's more straightforward. Um, the, luckily, the readout patterns for the other two instruments are more straightforward um, because the data rate problem is not so bad. Um, so these are the, nearest just has two readout patterns, um, NIST rapid, which is very analogous to the NERCAM rapid pattern. So in this particular case, um, N skip is zero, you don't skip any frames, um, and N frame is one, so that means you read all of the frames. Um, uh, just like uh, NERCAM, the frame time is about 10.7 seconds, um, and in this particular case, uh, the minimum number of groups and the maximum number of groups you can specify are one in 30. Um, this is in contrast to the NIST pattern. Um, in this particular case, n skip is still zero, so you don't drop any frames. 
but now n frame is four. That's to say that you average four groups or four frames into a group um, and then read that group out. Um, just like for NIST Rapid, the minimum number of groups is one, um, and the maximum number of groups is 200. Um, so in general, uh, the instrument teams do not recommend using a minimum number of groups of one um, because it's uh, more challenging to calibrate the data. Um, and you can see that the maximum number of groups in NIST Rapid is 30, and this is because if you want to use longer um, exposure times or integration times, um, that uh, you're free to do that using the NIST pattern. So Mary has sort of a similar construct, um, but it's been implemented in a slightly different way. Um, so Mary's rapid pattern is called fast mode. Um, in this particular case, uh, n skip is equal to zero. Um, and uh, it's just like n frame equals one, but Mary has this strange parlance that where they say n frame is equal to n group. But essentially it means that you're not averaging anything out and you're returning all of the frames that are observed. Um, and in this particular case, it takes about 2.775 seconds to clock through the array, so that's the frame time. Um, slow mode is done a little bit differently. Again, n skip is zero and n frame equals n group. And this is because um, the averaging is actually done on the detector level um, instead of in the ASIC. Um, and so um, these plots sort of give you a feeling for how this occurs. But essentially what happens is um, as you clock through the um, array, um, in fast mode, you just read out the pixel once and, and capture that value. But for slow mode, when you clock through the array, you actually sample each pixel eight times and then average that value. So it's kind of like having n frame equal eight. Um, and uh, as a result, the frame time is a, uh, about eight times longer, so it's about 24 seconds. Um, uh, in general, um, slow mode is uh, not recommended for imaging and not allowed for subarrays uh, because the sky is expected to be pretty bright. Um, and in general, the MIRI team also recommends a minimum of five groups per integration um, for good calibration. Um, two to four will be allowed um, with warnings, uh, but at the current time, uh, one is not. Um, so, uh, of course, there's going to be subarrays to enable observations of bright targets. Um, there's two kinds of subarrays, uh, point source subarrays and extended source subarrays. They get, this, again, is for NERCAM. Um, uh, for NERCAM in the short wavelength channel, um, the B3 detector is considered the fundamental detector. So that means that this is the detector that is used for flux calibration. So all the standard sources will be placed here. And so that means that all of the uh, point source subarrays are on uh, the B3 detector. Um, uh, and then the corresponding uh, part of the uh, uh, B module part of the, the NERCAM long wavelength channel. Um, this is in contrast to the extended source subarrays, which are actually located at the centers of the modules. Um, and so, for example, if you wanted to put Jupiter um, on, uh, the module, on the instrument, um, you would have then these intra-SCA gaps that you would have to dither over. Um, some of these boxes are a little bit confusing um, because the, the numbers, the sizes are the same, but the number of, uh, uh, but it, so if, if I've explained this, so, so basically in this particular case, the subarrays are 640 by 640. And for the long wavelength channel, you get one 640 by 640 um, field of view. But for the short wavelength field of view, you actually get four 640 by 640 um, subarrays. Uh, for example, if you were making that observation of Jupiter. Um, so uh, just to summarize, uh, or, or to, uh, slightly differently, um, the full field uses four amplifiers, the subarray uses one, and the subarrays are only taken on the, on the B module. So this is just a chart um, showing you uh, the sensitivities of the subarrays. And in general, they're designed um, to provide um, access to brighter targets. Um, so the, the uh, largest subarray gives you uh, two magnitudes compared to uh, the full, uh, full array. Um, a four magnitudes for the medium subarray, and then six magnitudes uh, brighter targets um, with the smallest subarray. Okay, um, MIRI has some slightly different considerations which um, drive the design of its subarrays. 
Um, and for, the, for this, I think it's important to remember um, what the infrared sky looks like and to understand what the backgrounds um, from the facility will look like. Um, so uh, these are Derby All Sky maps at 3.5, 25, 100, and 240 microns. Um, here you can see um, the light from the galaxy in the horizontal. This is the galactic plane. Um, and you can see um, light from uh, the zodiacal dust um, at an angle. Um, you can see predominantly scattered light at 3.5 microns um, and then more thermal emission, uh, particularly at 25 microns because the dust has a temperature of a couple hundred Kelvin. Um, and then as you go to longer wavelengths, cooler temperatures, you're seeing predominantly dust in the galactic plane. Um, but the important thing to note here is when you look at 25 microns, for example, um, uh, the brightness of the galactic plane in the Zodi um, can be as high as maybe 1,200 um, megajanskis per steranian, um, and uh, at the north and south ecliptic poles be quite low, be about 20 uh, megajanskis per steranian. And so one of the great advantages of uh, you know, some of the cryogenic facilities like Spitzer that operated at 4 Kelvin is that uh, because it was so cold, um, the background uh, from the facility was very uh, low, and so you would be able to measure uh, sources really exquisitely um, uh, even at very long wavelengths. Um, the background characteristics of JWST are uh, quite different. Um, uh, the majority of uh, JWST is uh, passively cooled and operates at 45 Kelvin. Um, of course, uh, the MIRI instrument, uh, the detector, has to operate at much cooler temperatures. So there's a cryocooler on board, um, which uh, cools part of the MIRI instrument down to about 7 Kelvin. Um, and so you can see this in the, in the background for the telescope. And so that's what this plot is. So it shows you the background flux as a function of wavelength. Um, and so A plus B, this is the contribution from the zodiacal light. So you can see the scattered component plus the, the thermal emission component. Um, and so uh, if you were using Spitzer, for example, that would be your, uh, depending on where you were looking, that might be one of your primary background sources. Um, but you can see that um, at longer wavelengths, uh, particularly 15 microns and beyond, there's actually a substantial contribution to the observatory background um, from stray light. And um, this pro uh, provides a background which is actually can be a couple of orders of magnitude larger than expected um, from, for example, the zodiacal light. And if you look at the magnitude of this, it's about 1,000 megajanskis per steradian. So this is even comparable to the light that you would see in the galactic plane or the brightest parts of the galactic plane or uh, the zodiacal light. And so you can imagine that all of that thermal emission um, has the potential to saturate the MIRI detector when you read it out in full frame. And, and, and this actually does happen if you uh, try to use the F uh, 225, the 25 micron filter. Um, uh, and so uh, one of the subarrays, for example, Bright Sky, has de been designed to mitigate this problem. So this is uh, a 512 subarray, so it's about a quarter of the field of view of the whole MIRI detector. Um, but it, it uh, is smaller to uh, increase or decrease the frame time, so it gets read out faster, um, so to avoid uh, problems with saturation on the thermal background or I'm sorry, the scattered light background from the telescope. Um, there are, you can see other um, uh, subarrays that have been enabled to, uh, you, to subarrays that have been designed to enable observations of bright targets. So sub 256, sub 128, and sub 64. These other subarrays are specifically for the chronographs and uh, slitless spectroscopy with the LRS. Um, and so you can see in this particular table um, how the frame time decreases um, as a function of the subarray size, and then the gains that you get um, in the bright source limit um, as you decrease the frame time. Um, so the, the next section is the sensitivities. So this chart here just shows you um, graphically uh, what the sensitivities uh, for 10,000, a signal to noise of 10 in 10,000 seconds is for all of the NERCAM filters. Um, so you can see these um, horizontal bars, they denote the width, the band pass of the filters. So you can see the extra wide and wide filters here at the bottom. Um, and you can see the medium filters are sort of shown in bold here. And then the narrow band filters at the top. Um, there's also a chart in here um, showing you uh, saturation. So this is 80% full well. 
um, if you do two reads of the full detector, again, for all of uh, the uh, filters. Um, I should say here that um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of this uh, performance uh, you know, is subject to change on orbit. Um, and that uh, for the best estimates, uh, you should uh, always use the exposure time calculator. Um, and then this chart just shows you the relative sensitivities of NERCAM and NERIS um, sort of side by side with some numbers that are, I think, a little bit easier to use. Again, um, for signal to noise of 10 in 10,000 seconds. Um, and the, uh, the relative merits of each instrument aren't um, immediately straightforward. Um, NERCAM, of course, has a smaller pixels in the short wavelength channel, um, which uh, can be useful for resolving out the background from zodiacal light, um, but also um, have the disadvantage of, you know, if you have four pixels, then you have more readout noise as well. Uh, Okay, and then this chart shows you the sensitivity and saturation limits for MIRI. Um, again, the sensitivity is uh, given signal to noise of 10 in 10,000 seconds um, for points and extended sources in this case, and also the saturation limits. So this, again, this is all for the full frame, and so uh, you should uh, be able to scale this um, uh, using, uh, you know, nominally scale or magnitude using uh, those factors from the subarray chart. Okay, so there's some additional, I think, considerations um, for uh, making and planning observations with JWST. One uh, that was alluded to earlier is observing overheads. Um, so I'm just going to make a few very generic statements here. Um, one is that the offset times, so to move the telescope within mosaics or dither patterns will depend on the size of the offset with larger offsets requiring more time. Um, and the, uh, for JWST, there will be smart accounting, and so uh, there will actually be, a, the, the charge will be based on the actual amount of time for the slewing. Um, for offsets that are larger, meaning 20 to 80 arc seconds, depending on your ecliptic latitude, um, will require a guide star acquisition. So uh, guide star acquisitions are more costly, um, that is that they take more time than just simple offsets. And it's important to be aware that um, mosaics in particular um, will trigger, um, mosaics especially with uh, NERCAM will trigger um, uh, guide star acquisitions. And actually some of the NERCAM dither patterns, particularly the full pattern, will also trigger guide star acquisitions. Um, and then the statement that I made before um, is that APT will be used to estimate the overheads. Um, the version of APT to be released in fall 2017 will include accurate cycle one overhead times. So some of you may have um, already uh, tried to play with APT. Um, so you can download APT from the internet um, and uh, you can switch between HST and JWST and you can mock up um, observing programs. And um, in the current version of APT, um, there are overheads included but my understanding is that they're not accurate. In many cases, they're um, overestimates. And so um, uh, just to be mindful that uh, to not uh, place too much emphasis on the amount of overhead time that you see in the current version of APT, and rather to wait for the fall 2017 version to really understand in a more accurate way what the overhead costs are. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Um, okay, I will. Uh, I will update the slides. Thank you for pointing that out. I think the other thing too is that APT has a grayed out box um, that'll give the exact visit splitting distance for an observation. So if you're curious about that level of detail, you can go into APT and see that. But thanks, thanks, Bill. Um, so uh, uh, some comments about uh, mosaicing versus dithering. Of course, if you want to cover uh, large fields of view. Um, then it's, uh, you know, it's necessary to use mosaicing um, instead of dithering. Um, the way that mosaicing is implemented is actually slightly different from dithering. And so um, the, the overheads associated with them will be different and the mechanism usage will be different as well. Um, so in the case of dithering, all spatial positions in a pattern are imaged through the same filter before you change a filter. So um, that has a relative, that minimizes the, um, number of uh, filter wheel mechanisms, 
uh, you know, uh, filter wheel turns that you make um, to preserve the mechanism lifetime. Um, but it's not possible to uh, necessarily have that rule in place um, for mosaics. Um, so it'll be the opposite for mosaics. That means that all filters in an observation um, will be executed before you move to the next mosaic point. And so um, this impacts uh, the mechanism uh, lifetime and also um, the overheads that are associated with mosaics compared to dithers. Um, so just a few last comments about um, uh, constraints uh, from uh, planning observations. Um, this figure shows you the orientation of JWST when it makes observations. So uh, the yellow dot here and here are meant to represent the sun, um, and uh, the sun shield is always pointed toward the sun. Um, you can tip JWST about five degrees toward the sun, or about 45 degrees away from the sun, and then um, you can imagine um, a, a, a tracing out an annulus on the sky um, uh, for your whole uh, field. Uh, so that means that you have about 50% of the sky visible at any one time. Um, and so the continuous viewing zone will be at uh, above plus and minus 85 degrees at the ecliptic poles. Um, we have uh, an additional uh, feature that uh, the roll capacity of uh, JWST is very different from HST. Um, on average, it's only possible to roll the telescope about plus or minus five degrees. Um, the instantaneous roll actually depends on uh, the ecliptic latitude of the telescope um, with uh, a full range of angles at the poles and um, only zero and 180 at the equator. Um, so this is really important because um, when you try to plan a mosaic, particularly if it is rectangular in shape um, and you want to constrain the orientation of that rectangle on the sky, um, you may be very limited um, in the times that you can schedule that mosaic. Um, and so um, one of the recommendations, at least for cycle one, um, is to try to perhaps break up these uh, observations into smaller chunks. Um, in cycle two, there will be additional capabilities that will be available. Um, in particular, um, there is um, a software tool being developed that, um, depending on the time that the observation is scheduled, will intelligently um, design your um, uh, mosaic to cover a field of view that you um, uh, trace out. Um, but in, the, in cycle one, essentially, it's going to be based mostly on the yeah, detector fields of view, for example, so saying um, everything offset in the detector frame. And so um, uh, this is a nice illustration from Massimo Roberto about how you might break up an observation to improve its schedulability. Um, and so this is an observation of the Orion bar um, that uh, Massimo has constructed where he's broken it up into three parts. Um, and so uh, the next slide here uh, shows you, basically, um, you can see uh, degrees on the y-axis and days since October 1st, 2018. So this is the beginning of ERS at this line. Um, the black line here shows you the solar elongation, um, and then the red here shows you um, when Orion generally is observable. Um, so the encouraging thing about the way that Massimo has designed this Orion bar observation um, is that uh, you can see uh, this is the aperture PA here, and so he's uh, designed um, this Orion bar observation um, so that you can make it at any time um, in the schedulability window. So he hasn't over-constrained it, so you can only make this observation in a small fraction of this window. So it's just something to be careful about. So um, uh, the last thing I was going to talk, the last two things I'm going to talk about are coordinated parallels and a little bit about detector performance. So for coordinated parallels, um, uh, there's been a decision to make available in cycle one limited parallel capabilities. Um, so uh, these will focus on imaging. So near cam imaging and MIRI imaging, near cam imaging in nearest uh, wide field slitless spectroscopy, MIRI imaging in nearest wide field slitless spectroscopy, near cam imaging in nearest imaging as well. Um, so in uh, the particular case of near cam imaging and MIRI imaging, uh, so if you were looking at um, any of these combinations with nearest, um, near cam and MIRI would be the primary uh, instruments, and so their dither patterns would drive the dither pattern for nearest. 
Um, this is different for the NERCAM and mirroring imaging combination. In this particular case, you can either have NERCAM prime or MIRI prime or ask that both instruments be prime. If NERCAM is prime, then its imaging pattern drives the pattern for the observation. If MIRI is prime, then MIRI's pattern drives the pattern for the observation. And if both instruments are designated prime, then um, there is a pattern that's been um, optimized to provide uh, the best uh, sort of subpixel sampling for both instruments simultaneously. Um, so you can see there are some um, issues that uh, uh, the pattern tries to take into account. One is that there's differences in the SI and the science instrument orientations and pixel scales. Um, you can see that Miri's offset with respect to NERCAM by about five degrees. Um, but in general, the goal of the, the dither patterns is to um, you know, uh, keep the pixel phases ideal to 5% um, of a pixel uh, with this exception for Miri. Um, so just know that this is there and um, that this uh, uh, pattern size is, is customized for each MIRI filter um, and it will come in small, medium, and large offsets. Um, and then just a couple slides about detector performance. Um, uh, this is a chart on uh, the NERCAM detectors um, and at the bottom you can see um, the noise performance for each of the SCIAs, um, the detectors, along with the requirements. In general, I think the message to take away from this is the uh, noise performance, the readout noise, is um, uh, meets or exceeds requirements. Um, and uh, you can see how the effective noise um, can be uh, beat down as you um, uh, average frames, uh, including more and more integration time. Um, uh, you expect this sh uh, should go down exponentially. Um, and there's actually, it's been noticed that there's a, a tail here that means that there's a little bit of an offset here, which corresponds to uh, one over F noise. Um, so right now, one of the things that the NERCAM team is working on is uh, trying to correct for the one over F noise. And just, this is my very last slide on MIRI detector performance. Um, I just wanted to say that the MIRI detector, the imaging detector, has great cosmetics. Um, there's less than 300 dead, hot, or noisy pixels in the science field. Um, and the heritage of the uh, MIRI detectors is um, uh, based on the heritage of the IRAC long wavelength detectors. And so it, it has some of the same features as that detector. Um, in particular, uh, uh, the, so in general, as I said before, um, uh, the PSF uh, for MIRI is uh, super sampled for most of the wavelength range. Um, and it's uh, well described at long wavelengths using the JVST diffraction profile. But at short wavelengths, particularly at 5.6 and 7.7 .7 microns, you actually see a cruciform pattern, um, which is due to uh, a scattering uh, within the detector. And so uh, this is some data showing you an actual um, observation um, at 5.6 microns, uh, a model PSF uh, for JWST, and then a model MIRI PSF, in, including the scattering. Um, and so you can see uh, this chart uh, says about what level um, the scattering occurs uh, for the instrument. So I, I think I've gone pretty long, um, uh, but if people are still there, I'm happy to answer any questions people might have either in the room here um, at Space Telescope or also online. I know that was a lot of information kind of fast. So, Bill. Absolutely. And the number of skips and the number of yep. frames and all that is encoded yes. in the, in the, uh, the readout pattern. Which I agree. Is often a top two thing like D2 I know. or medium two or whatever. Yeah. So, so that's just going to be a challenge that we're going to have to, if people have to specify n groups, n hits, and n groups, and if they hear about the specimen details, they have to understand what the groups are. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I think what Bill's saying is that, um, again, um, n frame and n skip are specified by these pattern names, um, and but the observer will have to specify n group and n int explicitly in APT. And so uh, people have to develop some sort of intuition 
um, for uh, what cases do you use which readout patterns. So, which is why I was hoping that some of this kind of information would be helpful. And I agree that ideally it would be nice if uh, APT automatically had the, this sort of level lookup table encoded in it um, to help uh, users take the optimal observations. I agree with you fully. I know that there are differences, uh, but, uh, but as, a, as a user, I don't think that we're I, I totally agree with you. I mean, one of the problems is that at the Institute, we have so much work to prepare for launch in cycle one that there's a huge wish list of things that we'd like. And it's just not simply possible to get all of that work done before launch. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned the user constraints. Mm -hmm. Which constraints in particular are you talking well, about? Particularly uh, timing and orientation, which is basically more or less the same time. The schedulability. So there's, there's actually, um, so unfortunately, it's like a lot of things I think that you're commenting about where, um, you know, in the early part of the mission, it's, um, you, you have to have a little bit more technical knowledge because the, you know, maybe the tools aren't as optimal as we'd really want them to be. But there's actually um, a schedulability tool um, that uh, has been designed by Chris Stark. Um, and I showed an output, a screen grab from it without telling you where it came from, this thing, um, that helps you determine uh, like what orientation your uh, you know, mosaic would be at compared to what your you know, available you know, orientations kind of are. And so um, my hope is to, um, as we get closer to proposal deadlines, um, have uh, speakers come talk explicitly about tools for planning observations. So this means have a dedicated talk about APT, have a dedicated talk about ETC, have a dedicated talk about the schedulability tool, or the scheduling tool, so. Exactly. Exactly. Well, so this is mostly a problem in cycle one, again, because we won't have the software enabled. So, so eventually in cycle two and beyond, you'll trace out a, uh, like an area on the sky that you're interested, it can be rectangular. And then um, the facility will go to um, schedule it, at, it'll give it a particular date. And based on that date, it will come up with a mosaic pattern that covers it, right? So this is mostly, I think, um, a problem for cycle one when that tool will not yet be delivered. And so this is mostly just a heads up to say that if you're proposing in cycle one, that you can play tricks like this to increase the schedulability of your observations. I was looking at it from the other way. Okay. Um, I, was, I was in Paris at Sketch of Before it launched, and when we had all these things coming in mm -hmm. for the very first time, yeah. we made these improvements, these problems were very familiar with the spot tool. Yes. So it allowed user constraints yes. in various different ways. Right, I remember. The Yes. Yes. It was almost impossible to actually then schedule. Is there a mechanism to at least limit this kind of thing? I mean, you said. So I think Bill can address this better, but my understanding is that APT will actually give you warrant. It'll tell you that you can't schedule stuff. 
Are there more questions? How about online? No questions online. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your patience. I know I went uh, long today. Um, and just a reminder that the next JWST webinar will be in two weeks, um, and it'll be Laurent Puyot talking about the uh, NERCAM and MIRI coronagraphs. Thanks.